In the realm of Breton folklore, a creature known by many names exists and is shrouded in secrecy. This enigmatic being has a rich history dating back centuries and will uncover its fascinating evolution from ancient folklore to modern interpretations as well as a story at the end. This is the history of the Bugle Nas. I'm your host, Kevin Torres, and I'd like to welcome you to the Creatures of the Crucible, where we try to sort through the mixture of history and mythology and understand how folklore has evolved with the growth of religions, beliefs, and societies. Our journey begins with a glimpse into the past, where we unearthed sources dating from 100 to 500 years old. These valuable sources were discovered through extensive research including books, novels, and internet archives. Our quest led us to a book in Stanford University's collection, a treasure trove of folklore in Brittany, France. Brittany, often associated with the Breton people and the Celtic heritage, is home of the original folklore pertaining to Bugle Nas. Written over a hundred years ago, one specific source is made to help understand Druidism, ethnographic views, and the primitive traditions of historic Brittany for its time. However, due to the language barriers of French and Latin, we found ourselves translating these sources. Our research reveals that Bugle Nas's earliest form was as a member of a group of black dwarfs who danced under moonlit nights around consecrated stones and sought refuge in caves or hollow rocks. These dwarves were said to exist throughout ancient and modern Europe, their character changing into many different beings with different names throughout different cultures. In Breton's history, we discover that one of these black dwarves was named Teus, figure from the folklore of Leonice and the cantons of Morlaix in France. In the 1500s, Teus's name was Latinized by St. Augustine of Hippo into Ducius, which means monster or incubus. The origin of the name Ducius can be traced back to Celtic roots, particularly the Scottish Gaelic and Proto-Celtic words dubis and dub, meaning black, hidden, darkness, or ink. In Augustine of Hippo's work, The City of God, we encounter the phrase demonos quos ducius galli appellant, which translates from Latin to a demon the Gauls called Ducius. Here, we glimpse the connection between Bugle Nas and its Celtic roots through an extinct Celtic language known as Gaulish, which only has a few fragmented pieces of text remaining. This marks a point in which religion started to alter the originality of this being. Moving on to the 1600s, our exploration takes us to a village called Rostrenin. Villagers from Rostrenin, as well as a Capuchin monk known as Gregor of Rostrenin, described Teus as resembling the color of an Armorican octopus. Their ancestors from the Rostrenin area also claim to have seen little black dwarves who dance around graves and dolmens. Across regions and cultures, these spectral beings were also known as Dus among the Swedes, Danes, and Irish, while in Breton mythology, Teus went by the name Bugle Nas, meaning child of the night or shepherd of the night, depending on how you translate the word bugle. As we navigate through history, we encounter more details by German scholar and metallurgist George Agricola, born in the mid-1500s. Agricola suggests that Bugle Nas evolved into a goblin or demon in German folklore, influenced by Greek mythology. This transformation eventually led to Bugle Nas being associated with the more modern Germanic folklore creatures in that part of the world, such as kobolds and goblins. According to the Archaeological Society of Morbihan, he could also be a demon or Drauk, Drac, Drake, or Drace, a wicked and destructive demon in Breton folklore. This demon's exact name I was unable to find as a being, but all the roots we discussed, like Drac, Drauk, and Drace, mean demon in different languages. This demon can take many forms which could explain how our black dwarf gained the ability to shapeshift. 
This is reinforced by a very old copy of a traveler's guide for Karnak and its surroundings from 1878 which say that Bugle Nas wears a large white coat on his tiny figure that drags across the floor, a hat bigger than a wheel, has the gift of metamorphosis, and can surprise anyone he dares. It also states that it would use shapeshifting to deceive its victims, usually turning into something very sought after at the time like a horse. At this point in time, the biggest fear with Bugle Nas was that he would kidnap children, or you, take you to a body of water, and if nobody came to your aid, your fate would be sealed by the creature as he drowned you. Now, our journey takes us to the mid-18th century, around 1857, where we discover a book dedicated to an unknown person's Joan of Arc collection. We were able to find some information in this source that discuss spirits known in Roman mythology as Lemores or Larvae. These restless spirits of the dead, much like the Black Dwarves, were said to inhabit caverns and wander at night, emitting disturbing cries. One specific Lamora spirit was known as Ducino, which is the same Black Dwarf that was named Teus that St. Augustine named Ducius, now known as Bugle Nas, marking another transformation in Bugle Nas's multifaceted history. As we approach the turn of the century, a story titled A Face of Clay by author Vachel Horace Onsley in 1906 links Bugle Nas to the restless spirits of Lemores. This period provides insight into Bugle Nas's assimilation into the broader category of Lemores in the early 20th century. At this point in time, it's clear that the folklore of our creature has been spread throughout many different cultures including Celtic, Roman, French, and has even made its way into collections and books at Harvard University. Our journey culminates with Emily Carpenter's novel, La Tour de Pro, in which Bugle Nas is described as a little man with claws, fiery eyes, and a whistling voice who gets joy from terrorizing shepherds and late-night workers. This depiction marks the transition to Bugle Nas's modern image, which remains relatively unchanged today. Chad Odell Roberts, in The Big Book of Monsters Volume 1, reaffirms Bugle Nas's reputation as a hideous creature who instilled fear in anyone crossing its path. Still, to this day, it's still debated on whether or not Bugle Nas was trying to attract victims with his cries and noises, or warn them away from danger. Is Bugle Nas benevolent or malevolent? Bugle Nas, the Night Shepherd, may have guided people to safety with its nocturnal warnings or herded its own shadow creatures as they roamed the night. Some legends even depict it as a shapeshifter, capable of taking various forms including gold rings or goblets in the water, waiting to ensnare and drown unsuspecting victims. If you believe he's malevolent, there's a few things you can do to protect yourself. One of the things is because he's got a whistling voice, you must avoid whistling whenever he is present. Another form of protection is Hawthorne, believed to possess the power to break enchantments. The sign of redemption, or a cross, could repel this pagan creature as well. Even a fence with crossed planks or metal bars act as a barrier. Additionally, a recently plowed field that once bore grain was considered consecrated ground, making it impervious to Bugle Nas's presence. As we conclude our journey through the intricate history of Bugle Nas, we are left with a creature who has undergone many transformations, its fate twisted through time by many cultures and religions. Transitioning from a black dwarf to a goblin, a restless Lemuri spirit, a werewolf, and even a shape-shifting demon. Its purpose in folklore was likely to keep children safe at night indoors with their families and away from perilous waters. One of the best sources of Breton fairy tales and folklore are from a man named Joseph Friesen, who from what I can find was a folklorist who collected a lot of stories during his time. In fact, when looking through French Wikipedia for Bugle Nas, there was far more references and sources, many being from his own work. One of Joseph Friesen's collections was available, 
just one, so I was able to translate some of its stories. However, they were very short and abrupt. What I'm going to do is combine the information we've learned throughout history, along with the stories that I read about Joseph Friesen, and I'm going to try to create my own, more fulfilling tale of this creature for us. I truly hope you enjoy it. Once upon a time, in a quaint village nestled at the foot of towering mountains and beside a shimmering lake, lived a young boy named Jan. Jan had just finished his daily rounds, venturing deep into the woods to gather herbs and reagents for his Aunt Elisa, the local apothecary. She was known far and wide for her unparalleled brews, wards, and protective potions. Aunt Elisa welcomed Jan back home, after snacking on some of the fruit he gathered on his trek, he began to head outside to find his friends. Aunt Elisa, in her gentle yet stern voice, reminded him of the ever-looming danger of the Bugle Nas, a nightmarish creature that roamed the countryside under the cover of the moon. The village had been telling tales of the Bugle Nas for generations, and the warnings had grown so repetitive that the children found them dull. Make sure you are home before the sun sleeps, or Bugle Nas will come to take you away, Aunt Elisa cautioned, tossing Jan a small satchel of hawthorn powder. Be safe, and don't be out late. I will, Aunt Elisa, Jan nodded, a hint of a smile on his face as he set off to meet his friends, Jean Pierre and Emilia. These three adventurous adolescents often ventured into the wild, unaware they are pushing the boundaries where reality and myth cross. On this day, they embarked on an excursion around the rugged terrain surrounding their village, determined to locate the cave where the Bugle Nas was rumored to reside. On a day without anything better to do, adventures like this were always the best way to stave off boredom. They hoped that by locating its lair, the villagers could seal its entrance and bring peace to their community. In the light of day, our young adults' courage was unmatched, but as dusk approached, so did their fears. Hours later, they returned to the village, realizing they had stayed out far too long. The village was eerily quiet, and torches already blazoned, casting ominous shadows across the cobblestone streets. As they approached the village, they spotted a magnificent horse in the distant fields, grazing near the edge of the lake. Its beauty was unparalleled, and thoughts of exploring and adventuring with a steed consumed their minds. They argued over who should be the one to bring it home, with Jean Pierre eventually persuading the others. I'm the oldest and the strongest. Let me be the one to tame the horse. I'm the only one to have ridden before anyways. Fine, but remember it's ours. We should all have a turn to ride it, said Amelia. But as soon as Jean Pierre mounted the horse, it sprinted uncontrollably towards the lake. Realization hit him like a bolt of lightning. This isn't right. He won't respond to anything I'm doing or slow down. He leapt off the horse just in time before reaching the edge of the water, watching the creature transform into a nightmarish monster as it plunged into the lake. It's a bugle nose. I have to get back to the village. Jean Pierre ran back towards home, but he could hear the creature resurfacing from the water behind him to start its game of cat and mouse. Its grotesque fingers barely grazing his shoulder as it pursued him relentlessly, its breath heavy and menacing. Reaching a fork in the road, Jean Pierre noticed the creature darted off in a different direction. The wooden trail sign shaped like a cross must have chased it off momentarily. He knew it would circle back though as soon as it found a way around and he was far from the safety of the village. Panic set in as he found himself stranded in the village's freshly plowed grain fields. As the bugle gnaws circled and taunted him, all Jean Pierre could do was wait and hope for his friends to come to his rescue. He screamed for someone, anyone to hear him. Help me! Amelia! Jan! I need help! 
Hearing his cries, Jan and Amelia, realizing the danger their friend was in, hurried to find him. We have to save him, Amelia. Hurry up, let's get going. The bugle Nas, sensing their approach, started to pace anxiously, glaring at them from a distance. Jan, remembering the Hawthorn powder from Aunt Elisa, shouted, Hawthorn! I have Hawthorn! He reached into his satchel and pulled out the precious substance. Together, Jan, Jean Pierre, and Amelia covered themselves in the Hawthorn powder, a known potent protective repellent against the bugle Nas. Get ready to throw it at him! No! With a determined throw, Jean Pierre flung the remaining Hawthorn at the creature, creating a plume of dust in the air that seared its skin and sent it howling in agony. As the creature retreated into the lake with a blood curdling scream, the trio knew they had triumphed. They had learned a valuable lesson about the dangers of night and gained a newfound respect for their elders' warnings. They would no longer venture into the darkness content to stay with their families and away from the perils of the unknown. And so, in the quiet village nestled at the foot of the mountains, the legend of the Bugle Nas lived on as a reminder of the importance of heeding the wisdom of those who came before us. I truly hope you enjoyed our creation of a story for the Bugle Nas. I want to take a moment to thank all of you for joining me today. If you liked this episode and all the information brought to you with it, consider visiting my Patreon to help me out with the creation of this experience. My goal is to release an episode just like this every one to two weeks. All links to my sources are in the description as well as a link to my Patreon page. Remember, mythology and folklore used to be called religion and beliefs. Thanks for joining me as we fished the Bugle Nas out of the Crucible and identified his history and past. The story from today's episode actually inspired me for next week. Catch the next episode focused around the Scottish mythological horse with ill intentions, the Kelpie. All research, writing, and production was performed by me, Kevin Torres, at McAllister Media. I hope to see you in our next episode.